Hi, everybody, and welcome to our presentation this evening, led by Dr. Paul Gray and by Keith Lackanen. We are so excited to have you here and learn more about the history of Audubon in the Everglades, but also in Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary in the past 70 years and looking ahead to the next 70. So without further ado, I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists here, and then we'll get started. Dr. Paul Gray is our Everglades Science Coordinator. He is a Audubon history expert and has focused on restoration and conservation in the Everglades and especially Lake Okeechobee for 30 years. We will also hear from Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary Director Keith Lackanen, and he will be talking not only about the history of Corkscrew, but also where we see the future of Corkscrew as a conservation leader in Southwest Florida. So Paul is up first. Paul, take it away. All right. Well, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Paul Gray. I work in our Everglades program. Um, and the reason I'm here tonight, I'm, I'm the warm-up act for Keith, and he's going to talk about Corkscrew Swamp in its 70th anniversary but I'm going to talk about the time before we owned Corkscrew Swamp, and I'm going to talk about how Audubon societies got started and what some of their early work was. And then I'm going to take you to Corkscrew Swamp 110 years ago when we had a warden guarding the bird colonies. So we're going to start the story in the late 1800s. And, you know, America was settling our country and we had these bountiful resources and everybody was out there just going, wow, this is great. We have all this wildlife we can shoot and eat and sell and um, we have all these trees we can cut down. And it was a big period of exploitation. But what was happening by the turn of the century, um, by around 1900, the bison herds, which were just unbelievably large, were virtually gone. We'd shot them all. And, and the passenger pigeons were that you know might have been the most numerous bird on the earth they were virtually gone and and at first people said well you know they just went somewhere else and then after a while we started to realize they didn't go somewhere else we wiped them out and the great auk was gone it was extinct already um the the bird colonies on on the rocks around maine you know the puffins and stuff all those colonies have been plundered um for feathers and eggs and meat and stuff like that and we had market hunting with waterfowl and their populations were down. So people were starting to realize that we can overdo it. We can shoot everything out. And one of the things that was really gripping American imagination next was the plume bird slaughter. And that was, of course, focused in Florida. And back then, uh, Florida may have had the most plume bird nesting of, of anywhere in the entire world in the Everglades. It was just this remarkable place for plume birds. And of course, they have pretty feathers. And so they're developed an industry and a fashion craze of shooting plume birds and plucking their feathers and putting them in hats. And so, and it wasn't a trivial slaughter. Uh, um, you know, if Yankee Doodle wants to put a feather in his hat, he only has to kill one bird. But if you want to furnish an entire industry that's furnishing hats for the whole country, you shoot every bird you can get. And so down in Florida, they were just shooting them left and right. And we were shipping hundreds of thousands of birds to New York City, which is where almost all the hats and adornments, it was not just hats, it was they would make dresses out of bird feathers and stuff. And so it's just really taking a toll. And, and unlike the bison and unlike the passenger pigeons where it's, you hear about something somewhere else, well, actually there's dead birds walking up and down the street of your neighborhood on people's heads. And so a lot of people really thought that was pretty repugnant. And that was a big impetus for the beginning of the Audubon societies. Next. And amidst all this carnage, um, <laughs> we're going to meet Joseph H. Batty. And he wrote this wonderful book, Practical Taxon Taxidermy and Home Decoration. Um, and he wrote, you know, a buck's head in the dining room or a bright oriole in the parlor presents a pleasing contrast. And so what he wrote was this whole book about how you could shoot and stuff different kinds of animals and, and adorn your home with them. And you could see this elk here is used as a gun rack. And it's really a very competent book. He was a good outdoorsman. He even has information on clothing and what kind of guns to use for birds and for small game and big game and mammals. And he even has information on how to do turtle hides and how to preserve ferns and all kinds of stuff. And anyway, so this is Joseph Batty of New England. He was involved in some of the taxidermy and some of the plume trade. Next. 
And here he is. This is actually him. And the reason he comes into this story is in the night. In the 1870s, there's an ornithologist called W.E.D. Scott, William Earl Dodge Scott, and he was from Princeton, and he came down to Florida, and he went around the southern rim of Florida from like Miami up to Tampa, and he saw these waiting bird rookeries that were just millions of birds dark in the sky, um, and again, they might have been the most abundant waiting bird nesting in, on the whole planet. And so in the 1870s, he gets back to Princeton, and he writes about it, puts it in the ornithological journals. He goes back 15 years later in the 1880s and he goes on the same route and the birds were gone. They were just all gone. They had all been shot out by plume hunters and he was mortified. And so he gets around to Fort Myers and he stops and he hears that there's a plume hunter off, off on a sandbar shooting, actually not plumes. He was shooting shorebirds and gulls and terns. And so the next morning, Batty goes, or W.E.D. Scott goes out to meet this guy and it's Joseph Batty. It's this guy. And and Scott sits there and shoots with him in, in the morning because Scott was getting specimens for his museum, so he wanted some specimens. But Batty was shooting birds to ship to New York. And Batty told him he had 60 gunners. That's six zero up and down the Gulf Coast and in the Everglades. And he even bought guns for some of them. And they would send him anything that they could shoot, any bird that you could get, you could get money for. And so W.E.D. Scott, you know, had seen all these birds plundered and 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 they were all gone and realized this guy was running an operation and he wasn't the only one. Uh, Batty said, or Scott said he ran into 50 different dealers of bird skins. And so he goes back and he writes this up. And and it got into the public perception and everybody was like, this is just nutty. So next. So in the mid 1880s, uh, a guy named George Bird Grinnell, who's the editor of Forest and Stream, which is now Field and Stream magazine, um, kind of was trying to get sentiment to quit shooting everything and let's let's be a little bit more civilized. And so he started a pamphlet for kids, and he called it the Audubon pamphlet. And he did that because he was a uh, tutored by John James Audubon's widow Lucy, and so he knew about Audubon and he respected him. And so he named this this pamphlet, you know, the Audubon Society pamphlet or whatever the exact name was. Mm -hmm. And it backfired on him. Um, basically, it became so popular that within about four years, he had tens of thousands of subscriptions. Kids just loved it. They liked the information. They liked the, the sentiment of we should be taking care of our animals and appreciating them. And so he stopped. But then a few years later in Massachusetts, they formed a Massachusetts Audubon Society. And their, their goal was to stop the, the plume bird shooting. And one thing that they did, and in 1900, we started the Florida Audubon Society. And one thing they did was they adopted the, the AOU, which was later called the Audubon Model Bird Law. And we'd passed bird laws in North America for decades and decades, and they never worked and no one enforced them. And the first laws, they just, people were kind of mad about everything being shot. They said, okay, we're going to make a list of things, don't shoot. <laughs> And so they'd have a list of 100 things you're not supposed to shoot. Well, in the first place, nobody can remember that list. You know, is this on the list? It's not. And if you shot a cardinal and someone tried to haul you in and get you in trouble, the person would say, I didn't shoot a cardinal. I shot a red bird. Well, the, all these common names. And so those lists were very bad. So the Audubon model bird law was they realized that there's really only a certain amount of birds that people really hunt. And what are they? They're the waterfowl, ducks, geese, and swans. And they're the grouse family, quail, grouse, ptarmigans, turkeys. And then there's a couple others like snipe and, and uh, woodcocks that are shorebirds and, and morning does. And so they made the short list. They said, we're going to make a list of the things that you can hunt. And we're going to put a season on them and we're going to put a limit on them. And that's, we're going to let you hunt, but we're not going to let you hunt to the point of extermination like we've been doing. So they're protected and everything else is off the list. And that was a very efficient law that if you could get someone in court, you could enforce it. But what happened is no one really paid attention to it. And if you notice in 1901, Florida adopts this model bird law. And it was William Dutcher who came down from New York City and got our legislature to adopt it. And Dutcher shortly thereafter had a stroke and, and Gilbert Pearson, who we're gonna read out of his book in a minute, um, he went around all these states and in his memoir, he says, oh, I went to New York and passed the law and I went to Maine and passed the law and I went to South Carolina and passed the law. And I was sitting there thinking, how can, how could this guy just go into these state legislators at the turn of the century and get them to pass a law that a lot of their citizens are not going to be favorable toward? They wouldn't like it. And it's it was <laughs> a revelation. Next. 
The reason they were so successful was women. <laughs> so it turns out, this is Clara Domrich. She was the founder of the Florida Audubon Society. And she called a meeting in, in the year 1900, one year before we adopted the model bird law. And she said, I'm going to make an Audubon Society. And of course, she was very well connected. And her husband was a, a very wealthy businessman and, and agricultural guy. And her first board of directors had two U.S. presidents, two Florida governors, the president of Rollins College, Reverend Whipple, who was a famous guy who had done a lot of work with Indians, and other influential people on her, on her board. And so when Dutcher got to Florida, the, the, the skids were greased. The women had already <laughs> convinced the men, you're going to do this. You're going to pass this law. And the first two people that started the Massachusetts Audubon, Harriet, Harriet Hemingway and Minna Hall, um, same thing, you know, wealthy, influential women. And so all these states were passing these laws because these women had time and they cared about it and they thought it was repugnant what we were doing. And if you read Pearson's book, he doesn't really talk about that much. He, you know, takes all the credit and women did all the work. But anyway, so we really owe it to women for getting Audubon to where it is. Next. So we got the laws passed. No one would enforce them. So Audubon said, OK, we're going to start hiring people and we're going to have the state deputize them and they're going to enforce the bird laws. And so this is Guy Bradley and we paid a salary and Monroe County down in the Everglades deputized him. And he was a functioning deputy for Monroe County. And he was supposed to protect the plume birds that were left down in the Everglades. And when he first started, he was just going around telling people, well, it's against the law to shoot these birds. And nobody down there at the turn of the century at 1900, I mean, Flamingo only had 50 families in it or something. Nobody believed him. And so he wrote to New York and said, nobody even believes me that these are laws. And so they sent him a copy of the law and he showed it to people. And they're like, they don't even believe that's a real law. But so he was having a lot of trouble and there was a lot of resentment. And there was one guy who was a, a neighbor in, in Flamingo who kept shooting birds and he arrested him and he arrested the guy's son twice. And then the guy said, if you arrest my son again, I'm going to shoot you. I'll kill you. And sure enough, the guy heard them shooting out in Florida Bay. He rode out in his boat. He was the only one there besides Walter Smith. And Smith shot and killed him. And he was found later in his boat. And Smith turned himself in. And there was a trial. But, but in the trial, they, Smith just claimed self-defense. There were no witnesses. And he got off. And so the American public was disgusted with this bird slaughter but then the person got killed over this was really kind of a terrible thing and three years later in in sarasota county um columbus mcleod another one of our wardens he disappeared we found his boat it was full of blood his hat had a hole in it like it might have been hit in the head they never found his body they never pr prosecuted anybody the same year uh presley reeves in south carolina he got ambushed and killed um no one ever found out who did that our warden on Orange Lake up near Gainesville got shot, but it wasn't lethal. So this was like a severely dangerous job. And, and it really was making the American people resolutely um, mad about this, this plunder, um, you know, killing people over killing birds. Next. So in comes Gilbert Pearson. He's the second uh, president of Audubon. In 1912, after all these people have been killed, Audubon hired Rhett Green, and he was a warden, and he was sent to, to a corkscrew to defend it. And so he knew people had been killed in the line of duty, and he was a corkscrew. So Gilbert Pearson went to visit him. And so in his book, the Bird Study book, um, he, he wrote about visiting um, Rhett Green. And so I'm going to read you some excerpts from his book about his description of corkscrew swamp, which was probably about 1915 or 1916. And so... Um, he he was in Fort Myers, and so Pearson writes in his book, uh, next. Okay, yeah. So Pearson writes, some time ago, I visited the warden of this reservation, Corkscrew, located in the edge of the Big Cypress Swamp, 32 miles south of Fort Myers. Arriving at the colony late in the evening after having traveled 30 miles without seeing a human being or human habitation, proceeded to make camp. So he went from Fort Myers to Corkscrew, didn't see one single person. Might not happen nowadays. And so the next day they get up and they go into the swamp. And so he wrote, we crossed a glade about 200 yards wide and then entered the swamp. And if you've been on the Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary, the boardwalk starts, you go across this grassy glade, which Pearson walked across and you enter the swamp. 
And he went on to say, there are many things unspeakably stimulating about a journey in such a tropical swamp. You work your way through thick, tangled growths of water plants and hanging vines. You clamber over huge fallen logs, damp with rank vegetation, and wade through a maze of cypress knees. Unwittingly, you are sure to gather on your clothing a colony of ravenous ticks from some swaying branch. Red bugs, which are chiggers, bent on mischief, scramble up on you by the score and bury themselves in your skin, while a cloud of mosquito weighs behind you like a veil. In the somber shadows through which you move, you have a feeling that there are many unseen things that crawl and glide and fly, and a creepy feeling about the edges of your scalp becomes a familiar sensation. And so this is where I have to apologize to Keith to make a walk on his lovely boardwalk sound boring as all get out. But anyway, that's what Pearson wrote, so I have to say that. So next. And he continues, although the swamp was unpleasant underfoot, we had but to raise our eyes to behold a world of beauty. The purple blossoms of air plants and the delicate petals of other orchids greeted us else everywhere. From the boughs overhead, long streamers of gray Spanish moss waved and beckoned in the breeze. Next. And he says, still higher on gaunt branches of giant cypresses, a hundred feet above our heads, great grotesque wood ibises were standing on their nests, wood storks were standing on their nests or taking flight for their feeding grounds a dozen miles southward. We were now in the midst of an immense bird city. There were probably 100,000 wood ibis inhabiting corkscrew at the time of my visit. I mean, he was seeing the real deal and this colony had not been shot out. Next. And the thing he was really interested in was the, the egrets because they have these fancy feathers and this is the most prized bird feather. They were reportedly worth the weight of gold um $32 an ounce or whatever it was back then and so he writes the most interesting birds those concerning which the Audubon Society is most solicitous are the white egrets these snow white models of grace and beauty have been persecuted for their plumes almost to the point of extermination and here is situated the largest assemblage of them left in Florida and he continues these long whites are never off my mind for a minute said the warden as we put pause to watch them fly over Two men came to my camp last week who said, who thought I didn't know them, but I did. They were old time plume hunters. They said they were cattle hunting, but I knew better. They were after egrets and came to see if I was on guard. I told them if they saw anyone after plumes to pass the word that I would shoot on sight any man with a gun who attempted to enter the corkscrew. I would do it too, he added as he tapped the barrel of his Winchester. It is terrible to hear the young birds calling for food after the old ones have been killed to get the feathers for rich women to wear. I'm not going to have my birds sacrificed that way. And Pearson, who knew about the, the deaths, he was the president of Audubon when Bradley was killed, continues, this is, this is a region where the Audubon warden must constantly keep his lonely watch. For should he leave even for a short time, there would be danger of the colony being raided and the protective work of many seasons wiped out. The successful shooting trip of plume hunters to the course group might well net the gunners as much as $5,000, which in today's would be more than a hundred. And in a count, count country where money is scarce, that would mean a magnificent fortune. The warden is fully alive to this fact and is ever on the alert. And Pearson knew this also because there was a rookery that Guy Bradley guarded called Cuthbert Rookery, and it had been shot out twice before Bradley was hired. And it was back in the Everglades and it also was hidden by a guy named Cuthbert who lived over um, on Marco Island. And his second trip into the rookery, he made $1,800. He bought half of Marco Island, which I don't know what that would be worth today. Um, he also built a three room house and he bought a schooner. And he was written up in the newspaper as being a successful guy and he had a great hunt in the Everglades and, and he was being prosperous. And back then, plume birds were the third major income in the region. First was cattle because they had panorasa, second was agriculture, and third was plume birds. So it not only wasn't reviled, but some people thought it was kind of respectable. And anyway, so, and what happened to Guy Bradley is once he got on, on guard, he was protecting Cuthbert and he had to go to Flamingo for supplies. He went into town one night, went out the next day, and the guys had shot it out. And when Frank Chapman was coming to try to go see Cuthbert and he said, it's been shot out, he said, you could have walked right around the rookery on them birds' bodies. 
And Chapman, seeing the rough world that Bradley was living in, later in his notes wrote, that man Bradley is going to be killed sometime. He had been shot at more than once, and someday they are going to get him. Again, really tough job. Next. So here's a picture of Rhett Green's camp on the edge of Corkscrew that, that Gilbert Pearson said. And Gilbert said, as he left, he said, I like to think of Green as I saw him the last night in camp, his brown, lean face aglow with interest as he told me many things about the birds he guarded. The next day I was to leave him, and night after night he would sit by his fire, a lonely representative of the Audubon Society, away down there on the edge of the Big Cypress, standing as best he could between the lives of the birds he loved and the insatiable greed of fashion. And, you know, this is a testament to how much we can love um, our resources, um, which we still love today, and, and Keith's going to talk about our more recent work. So next. So Pearson left, and, and it turns out that we did turn the corner on it, and, and we got the plume hunting to really die down and, and other types of over-harvest of, of American wildlife, and they really bounced back. And, and it was a great success story that it was long, it was hard. Uh, the next slide is a passage from Arthur Howell's Florida Bird Life. This is the first really competent bird book about Florida bird life. And he wrote a chapter on conservation and he wrote, the long and unremitting but finally triumphant struggle of the Audubon societies for the rescue from extinction of the plume birds presents a record probably unparalleled in the annals of conservation. No organization has ever encountered more disappointments or more bitter discouragement and none has ever overcome them with more splendid success. It is an interesting and inspiring story of devotion to a worthy cause. Um, I started in the 1850s, 1880s, and now we are in the 1930s. This took 50 years. And we really did bring back a lot of birds. But then humans kept overpopulating and we started draining. We started logging off forests. We started plowing prairies. We started polluting. And the challenges for birds became much, much more complicated than just the question of whether we should shoot them. And so Audubon with Corkscrew had to change their strategies. And so I'm going to stop now and turn it over to Keith, and he's going to take up what we're doing nowadays with Corkscrew way beyond just trying to stop the shooting. So thank you, folks. Thank you, Paul. Um, it's really neat to think about that and uh, Gilbert Pearson's account. And I'm really grateful to be part of such a place with such a rich history of dedicated protectors. Um, my name is Keith Lockinen. I was born and raised in Southwest Florida. I'm a local kid. Um, and I've been coming here since I was a kid. Um, I really, you know, love this place. And this is my home. I'm a birder. I'm an advocate of Florida's wild places. And there's no better dream job than me than helping protect and having the charge of conserving Park Street Swamp Sanctuary. Next slide. <clears throat> So, and there's my home, South of Florida. So if you wonder where Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary is, it's north of Naples, south of Fort Myers, east of Bonita Springs, and west of Mockley. It's that little piece of green paradise right there in the middle. Next slide. <clears throat> so the next big threat after we saved the plume birds was actually protecting their habitat. And the threat came in the form of logging in South Florida. Well, in the 1940s and 50s, times were different, and we were rebuilding Europe. We were having the baby boom after our servicemen came back after World War II, and one of the most valuable resources we had was Cypress. And so the loggers were starting in South Florida. They started in Big Cypress. They started moving their way through Fakahatchee Strand. They started moving their way up through even conserved lands just to the south of us, and pretty soon they were knocking on the door of Corpse Shoes Farm Sanctuary. Next slide. <clears throat> So loggers often get a lot of blame for what they've done, but they also are part of the solution. They actually recognize that, you know, this section of Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary, Corkscrew Swamp just back then, was a really special place. And so they helped with the first donation of land, the first, and the community helped purchase 5,600 acres in Deep's National Audubon Society. And that was the founding of the Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary. So in 1954, the community came together and helped protect this place. And little did we know, here, 70 years later, in 2024, that Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary would hold the largest strand of old growth cypress forest left on the planet. We have to be so thankful for our fur bears and from even Lee Tidewater Cypress for having the thought to help protect this place. Next slide. <clears throat> 1956, they built the first boardwalk. 
the local Wooden family uh, built the first boardwalk. It was 5,600 feet, uh, went into the cypress forest and went right to the base of one of the largest cypress trees in the sanctuary. And for the first couple of years, we had over 10,000 visitors a year, which is a pretty big deal in South of Florida. It was, wasn't very populated back then. And 2000 was a really important milestone for Corpse Swamp Sanctuary. Thanks to the Lord, late Dorothy Blair and many other passion supporters of Corpse Swamp, the Blair Sanctuary was founded in 2000 and provides the perfect setting to welcome over 100,000 visitors a year. And we still have that place today and we're so grateful to Dorothy Blair and her family. Next slide. <clears throat> we're also internationally important, as I mentioned. In 2009, we were designated a wetland of international importance under the Ramsar Convention, one of only 2,300 sites worldwide. Next slide. In 2013, the Western Everglades Research Center was established here at Corks Group. And this is a way we're able to put our science into effect to help support critical data in support of regional wetland conservation. Next slide. In 2018, one of our most ambitious projects started. We began Martian Prairie Restoration, kicking off a multi-year, multi-million dollar effort, which has yielded so much success. Next slide. In 2022, another milestone came. We, we began to launch our capital campaign to elevate construction and conservation education of our new campus. And so what this is really gonna allow us to do is to expand our ability to conduct conservation and education not only here in Corkscrew, but all in all of Southwest Florida. Next slide. And as we celebrate here in 2024, we are so grateful. At a time when water quality is so important to Florida against well-being and prosperity, we're growing our restoration land stewardship to support our Wetland Restoration Center of Excellence. Thanks to the support of Representative Laura Mello and Senator Kathleen Pasadomo, we're thrilled and grateful to announce that Corks will receive a $5 million appropriation in support of our capital campaign. Very exciting stuff, and this is gonna be a huge momentum shift for us doing our work. Next slide. So this is a, this is a really important slide and just kind of want to think regionally about Corkshire Swamp Sanctuary. That little yellow box in the middle is our 13,000 acre sanctuary. That green land around us is also conservation land. While we're 70 years old, in the 1980s and 90s, the state and local government started realizing how important Corkshire Swamp Sanctuary is, but also the watershed. So this Corkshire Regional Ecosystem Watershed concept was established and the state and local governments conserved over 55,000 acres to help protect this really critical watershed. And today it stands as one of the last pieces of an intact watershed here in the area. Next slide, please. So of that 13,000 acres from the boardwalk, you can only see about 1%. So you can see there's a lot of work going on in the backcountry that people don't realize. We have a lot of work to do back there. Next slide. So today we're best known for a two and a quarter mile boardwalk that allows visitors to enter this amazing sanctuary and swamp. You don't have to do all those things that Paul was describing, climbing over logs, getting wet, and climbing over all kinds of vegetation. It's a really wonderful place to go birding and to relax in nature. Next slide. And there's some amazing sites out there. Ghost orchid, which is one of the rarest orchids in North America. Actually, it began blooming again today. We have our first new orchid of the second rounds of blooms are taking place. And really iconic other wildlife, such as the painted bunting. Our painted bunting should be arriving here in just a couple of months, and you can see them right from visitor center, right from a window. Next slide. <clears throat> and it's an amazing time to come out and relax and be surrounded by nature. 500 year old trees surround you and you can really get a sense of how spectacular this place is. When I look up at these trees, I think of these as almost coral reefs. They've just got so many things growing on them, depending on them, all these microclimates, vegetation, lichens, mosses, insects, birds, all the way up the food chain. It's just a really special place to enjoy. Next slide. But historically, we served as the, head, as the headwaters of the Imperial River. If you walk up our entrance, entrance walkway, you'll see a sign that says, you have to save the swamp a thousand times, you only get to lose it once. That's just as true today as it was back then. 
Historically, that flow of water, our hydrology, went from the northeast to the southwest. It came from lands to the northeast of us, which includes the Crew Headwater Marsh today, to the Imperial River, Coquihatchee, and to Naples Bay to our south. And now the water moves south via the canal system. And this is not just Corkshire Swamp Sanctuary. This is all of South Florida. And in many ways, these canals and this drainage has made it possible for us to live in South Florida, but also has unintended consequences sometimes. Next slide. So this is a really sciencey slide, so I'll try and explain it best to you. This is the hydrology of the sanctuary. On the left axis there, you can see the height of the water or the depth. On the right, you can see the time of year. And so if you look at it, there's a green line, there's a blue line, so that's the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. You can see that there was always a little bit of water in the sanctuary from 4.8 to 5 foot, even in June, which is the dry season. And then we peaked in September, October, which you still do today. And there's a nice slow recession all the way through April, May. And we bottomed out in April, May. About the 2000s, something drastically changed. And if you look at the left side of that, we started every wet season completely dry. The sanctuary was drying almost every single year. It would reach those same peaks, not quite as high, but then it would get drier much quicker. And those rates of recession were much more pronounced. And if you have a swamp, that can have major implications for a lot of things. Next slide. So why is that water leaving our system? Um, you know, there's several things that people look at and they think, you know, that may be the issue. And we've actually done some of our own science and modeling here at Corkshire Swamp to try to determine what those things are. There's agriculture, there's changes in the landscape due to vegetation, there's population change. But the thing that really is drawing down the most water is that drainage system, which is actually doing its job too well in some places. Next slide. So the implications are really important and they're not just for the sanctuary, not just for wildlife, but for people too. Changes in vegetation, wildlife communities, understory microclimate. And as we've seen the South Florida the last several years, there's been a cycle of devastating flooding and wildfires. And Collier County especially, we had seen some of the biggest wildfires over the past 20 years in South Florida. Next slide. Not only that, but these fresh water wetlands are so critical to the coast. The water here in Corkster Swamp Sanctuary is some of the cleanest in Southwest Florida. The water here in the sanctuary goes right out to Wiggins Pass. So there's a real corkscrew to the coast connection. And as Floridians have seen over the past five to 10 years, water quality at the coast really matters. It matters for not just the wildlife, but the ecology as well but also the economy. And so the more clean water we can have going towards the coast is really gonna make a difference for coastal resilience and also inland resilience as well. These fresh freshwater wetlands in, inland are so important. Next slide. Talking about that hydrology, you know, how does it affect us? You know, we have some pretty major habitats. Our marshes are drier 29% of the time. Bald cypress, 18% of the time. And our pond, which is the lettuce legs area, which is the big cypress trees, the 500-year-old cypress trees, they're drier two months more out of the year. And so that is really, really tough on an ecosystem. Next slide. So these swamps and these sanctuaries, you know, they're really about growing food, growing food for wildlife, growing fish and crayfish. And if you're, if you're resetting that system every single year, if the sanctuary is going dry, these swamps are going dry, you have to start from scratch every year. So the process to build that food forage for, those, for birds, for alligators, for turtles, all those things is much, much harder. And so it is much more difficult for wildlife to depend on these places to have successful food sources. Also plants, the ghost orchid. Uh, the ghost orchid is a rare plant and it grows in very limited places in South Florida due to very specific microclimates. It needs a swamp. It needs water in the swamp. Fire risk. You know, this is a risk for wild places, but this is also a risk for some of these suburban areas and urban areas. I live just south of here about 10 miles and wildfires is probably my biggest fear living out here. And so the quicker these places dry down, the longer they're drier, the more fire risk we have. Water storage. You know, you cannot say enough about how important it is to put water in the ground to restore aquifers. 
you know, if you like, if you like fresh water, fresh water coming out of your faucet, you know, think about places like Corkscrew. And again, the edge tourists, you know, Corkscrew and places inland are the connection to the coast. And it's really important to have that fresh, clean water going downstream. Next slide. One of the other things we've seen is that the hydrology has consequences that we didn't even realize for a while that have really taken off. This is a native plant. It's called Carolina willow. This is a giant bush. Uh, these trees are 10 to 15 to 20 foot tall. They go in in an area where the hydrology changes, and they begin to take over absolutely everything. They are unable to support fire. You can't run a fire through there if you want, prescribed fire or wildfire. They reduce foraging habitat, increase water loss. So while there may still be water and fish under there to a wading bird, this is a desert. It's not able to actually get down to that fish to be able to feed on it. So it's really harmful for the future possible survival of some of these species if we're not able to manage these habitats better for them. Next slide. So this is what we call shrubification. And it's not just a phenomenon here, of course, your swamp sanctuary. And you can see everything in that bright green. That's a lot of acreage. That is actually former marshes and wet prairies that have turned over into the shrub forest. If you look to our northeast and our east around Lake Trafford, around the crew area, this is happening in a lot of areas. So we had to get creative with how we attack this problem. Next slide. So there's a whole method to this, which would be a whole nother presentation, but basically once you go in and you can remove some of that Carolina willow and you can open these places up, wildlife responds, fish responds. You get an instant response of wildlife coming back into these areas, pelicans, wading birds, being able to get in access that fish, it makes such an immediate difference. And then as you get that vegetation back, you can return a natural fire interval to be able to manage these places better. Next slide. And this is one big one of our biggest successes. We have over 1,400 acres under restoration. This multi-year project, we've raised over $700,000 annually. We've had hundreds of supporters and individuals, individual and corporate partners such as Arthrex, Community Foundation in Collier County, SeaWorld, and of course, Publix, who has been a massive supporter of our conservation work here. Next slide. So we we'll talk about some of the changes and stresses in hydrology. You know, you think, oh my gosh, you know, what are we gonna do? Well, we can still save the swamp and we're gonna do it another time, one more time. We are so thrilled to be part of one of the biggest things that is gonna be helpful for Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary, but also our watershed. Partnering with South Florida Water Management District, and I want to really call out uh, Colonel Colonel Charlotte Roman. Uh, she's the head of the Big Cypress Basin Board. Um, she's on the uh, South Florida Water Management District Governing Board, and she's been a real champion of this, of trying to identify strategies to look at restoration of the entire system, really looking at hydrology, and all those things I talked about: re reducing flood risk, maintaining water supply, and also engaging our partners. This isn't just about corkscrew. This is about other places too, but we are the heart of this. Next slide. And this map just kind of shows you, you know, it's corkscrew swamp sanctuary, it's bird worker swamp, you know, it's crew marsh, it's flint pen strand, it's these other places. So any solution which is going to help us is going to help all these other protected lands. And let me tell you, development is coming in on all sides. So conserving and protecting these lands, restoring hydrology is now more important than ever before. And so we're so grateful working with our water management district partners and looking at this effort. And this effort is huge. The total modeling effort for this is over a thousand square miles. It's almost half the county. So there's a lot of investment going into helping protect these natural ecosystems and help restore them to what they once were. Next slide. And so as we move forward, our capital campaign is one of these cornerstones of what, as how we continue through the next seven years. It's gonna strengthen our ability to deliver programming and really expand our capacity. You know, thanks to generous donors like Paul Pachter, we're able to have this outdoor classroom. We're gonna have more school kids from, from local uh, areas in Southwest Florida, be able to come in and actually experience the sanctuary and be engaged in the swamp and immersed in the habitat. And I think this is a real rare opportunity and we're just so thrilled to provide this for our community as well. Next slide. And then working with local architect, David Corbin, you know, it's given us a vision for how we can actually continue to expand our campus. You know, having a research laboratory here on base is gonna be so important to us. 
you know, John Jack Hayward Western Everglades Research Center is going to be such a centerpiece to that. Having spaces for collaboration for our land steward folks where who are able to conduct a prescribed burn and come back and be able to have a place to stay overnight while they're monitoring the burn. Having places where we can plan and coordinate and collaborate with our partners throughout the region. So there's just so many wonderful opportunities and we're just so thrilled to begin the next 70 years with this transformational opportunity for us. Next slide. So of course, people wanna know how you can help. Of course, visiting the sanctuary is helpful to us. Um, it, it helps us, you know, but it also helps people understand, you know, what this special place is all about. Get an insight, you know, not just visit, but try to come out to one of our events. Uh, schedule a tour with some of our volunteer boardwalk naturalists who are absolutely amazing. Learn your local birds, uh, learn about insects, orchids, all kinds of things. Become a member, volunteer here. This is one of the greatest places to volunteer in Southwest Florida. Of course, supporting us through donations and including us in your state plans as well. Next slide. And that's all I have for right now. So I'm happy to turn it back over to Julie and answer any questions with Paul. Yeah, so Erica here, uh, again, comms director. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. We have some great questions already. And so I'm just going to start by reading them out. Folks, if you want to ask any more questions, uh, both the Q&A and the chat are uh, successfully open now, so I can take your question either way. So I'm going to start with one that is very top of mind, which is how did the, you know, the natural drainage of the sanctuary work after your recent hurricane event or a rain event? You know, what do you see out there after a major rain event? Yeah, so I was just out on the boardwalk this week and the swamp did its job. We have uh, 3.6 feet of water in the swamp, uh, which is some of the highest water that we've ever had for this time of year. So keeping that water in the swamp keeps it out of, you know, places which can be harmful for people. So working together with the water management district to be able to keep water in these places instead of where they'll be harmful. And also the water management district, you know, they do a great job of, you know, doing this incredible balancing act of trying to protect these natural systems and help also protect people downstream. And so one of the things that, you know, is going to continue to work with is, is making sure that the water management district and our local partners have the ability to operate after a severe system like a hurricane comes through without flooding, you know, the local area, but also keeping enough water in the sanctuary to help it do its job and help clean and protect that water and also offer services like aquifer recharge and get it to the coast cleanly. Awesome. You actually hit another question with that answer. So well done. Uh, here's one of my favorite questions because like you said, you were just out on the boardwalk. It's August. It's hot. It's the wet season. What birds can visitors see right now? And you know, how many are out there? So I, I'm a birder and I wouldn't even take a swing at how many birds are out there at any given time, but I'll tell you, um, migration's on, uh, prothonotary warblers are popping back in the sanctuary. Um, I have been hearing yellow-billed cuckoos nearly every day. Uh, the perulas are coming through more every day. Um, you know, the beginning of migration, August and September, October, you're going to see those neotropical migrants start to come through. And that's also the fun time of year we get to see our winter birds start to come in, such as gray cat birds, you know, some of the vireos and other things. So every time of year can be a little bit different. And I think every day can be a little bit different, especially in migration. So, um, one way to check on that is you can look at eBird, you can look at what folks have been seeing and just check out our sightings, sightings board before you go out on the boardwalk, you can have an idea of what has been seen recently. All right, Paul, I'm gonna put you on the spot. I have a question about Columbus McLeod. So who was the Audubon warden in Florida who was shot but not killed around the same time? Was he presumed murdered? What, is there um, anything you can tell us about Columbus McLeod? Okay, yeah, so this was not Columbus because he disappeared and was never seen again, but the guy at Orange Lake who was shot, um, Pearson did not identify him by name. Um, we had a guy named either Maynard or Baynard, I never can keep those guys apart, who worked around at Orange Lake for a period of time, and it might have been him, but I've not been able to pin that down, so sorry. <laughs> I've been looking. I have every confidence that you will eventually be able to. There's no stone that you've left unturned, Paul. <laughs> 
Um, Keith, back to you. Is the sanctuary still a good refuge for panthers? Does it provide panther habitat? Ah, uh, fantastic question. So um, that backcountry, that 13,000 acres that the public doesn't see, um, we have some of the highest panther populations in the state of Florida. We have been told by some very well-known panther biologists that we are one of the pantheriest places in the state of Florida. And there's a couple places in our backcountry where uh, it is a good possibility that if you stayed in the same spot for about eight to 10 days, which, you know, maybe Rhett Green was the last person to be able to do that down here, you know, you're almost guaranteed to see, guaranteed to see a panther. And I had the opportunity on my 364th day of working here, uh, we were coming through the back country on a swamp buggy and I got to see a mother and two of her kittens. And so it is just phenomenal that we're able to provide all this habitat for these Florida panthers and, you know, not only for them, but the prey they prey they need. And also this restoration work also benefits them as well by, you know, helping grow some of their prey items, such as, you know, raccoons, deer, rabbits, all those things. So, yeah. And there's a couple famous videos of panthers on the boardwalk. So another opportunity to come visit the boardwalk early. You never know what you're going to see. Awesome. So I'm going to ask this next question in two parts. So I'm going to ask it first to Keith, who is going to talk about Corkscrew, who, as everyone I'm sure knows, is the gateway to the Western Everglades. And then I'm going to ask Paul, because Paul is our Lake Okeechobee expert and, you know, has been working in the Everglades for 30 years. So first, Keith, and then we'll zoom out to Paul. Keith, how is the changing climate affecting corkscrew um, either so far or what you anticipate as we pivot to our next 70 years of conservation? So that's one. I agree to myself. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of a known unknown. Um, we do know that things are changing. Um, you've all seen the hurricane forecast for this year. Um, we're having bigger hurricanes, more of them. Uh, hurricanes is, is one of the biggest um, events that natural events that can impact South Florida on the you know landscape scale, and so uh, the fact that we've had you know so many in recent years you know really is going to you know possibly change that you know you wonder you know how long those you know big cypress continue to withstand you know so many hurricanes. Uh, there's a lot of speculation about rainfall patterns. Um, you know I think you know people hate hearing qualitative data, but being born and raised here in Southwest Florida, um, I can tell you last year was the hottest year I've ever seen. It was the driest year. And so we are having these changes in rainfall patterns in you know, the amount of heat we're seeing. And for sure, it is not as cold down here as it used to be. We used to get regular frost back here, which used to knock back some of the plants in the back country, such as cocoa plum. We don't have those frost anymore as regular. And so some of those plant communities are changing due to it. So, Paul, how are you seeing a changing climate affecting your work slash how are you anticipating a changing climate, you know, in the wider Everglades and or Lake Okeechobee? Yeah, so as Erica said, I work primarily on Lake Okeechobee. And as most people have probably heard, the lake has problems when we get a hurricane, it gets too deep. And then the Corps gets afraid of the safety of the dike and they frequently make big harmful releases to the estuaries and it harms the lake. And then when we get droughts, the lake's too shallow and it goes down and sets record levels. And, and, and part of the reason is because of drainage. Uh, drainage makes the lake go up too fast because it's very efficient. And then when you have a dry period, there's no water left in the watershed. So the lake goes down without a bait. And climate change threatens to give us wetter, wets, and drier dries. So something that's already a, a big challenging problem for the lake is likely to get even more challenging. And Again, that's part of why we're building Everglades restoration is try to build us more water infrastructure to buffer us from these extremes. All right, we have time for about one more question, but I'm going to smush two together because it's sort of a similar question. Keith, this last one is for you. It's about invasive species. So pythons are often top of mind for Everglades now. So uh, two people were wondering if there was a Python update for the sanctuary. 
And then one person was curious how invasive apple snails have impacted the sanctuary or not. So um, happy to say that Python is not here yet. Um, we have, uh, our staff is monitoring the backcountry. They're monitoring the areas around us. We had a Python killed about a mile and a half south of here uh, last year. I think it was only about seven and a half foot. You know, when you're talking about invasive species that's only seven and a half foot, you know, you're talking about something pretty serious. So uh, we have a rapid response plan in effect. Uh, you know, we are going to be ready to hopefully pounce on the problem um, if they get here. I, I cross my finger and say if, you know, but it's more likely when. Uh, and they are disrupting so many ecosystem processes in South Florida. Um, those apple snails, invasive apple snails, they've become the dominant apple snail in South Florida. And I'm not enough of an expert to be able to tell you, you know, what effects they've had on the ecosystem. They're certainly larger. You know, they certainly produce more eggs. Uh, they're certainly much more common than they used to be, you know, but there's also some weird things where nature can adjust. Uh, you know, limpkins are becoming, you know, more and more numerous across South Florida. And Everglades and snail kites have actually evolved to actually have their bill length longer so they can adapt to these invasive apple snails. And so as a result, their numbers have actually started to rebound. So I think nature is resilient in a way that we don't completely understand yet. That's a great mystery yet to solve. But, um, you know, invasive species are something that, you know, we have to deal with as, as part of life down here. Well, thank you so much, Keith. And thank you so much, Paul. And Thank you all for attending this webinar this evening. We will be sending a recording to uh, folks who attended the webinar and also to everyone who'd like to tune into this unique presentation. So thank you all so much and have a wonderful Wednesday. Thanks, everybody.